very welcome to our, I think it's the sixth edition of our online liturgy that I coined Living Room Liturgy and most of the time my tongue doesn't twist on it but every now and again I find myself in a tongue twister over what I named this event to be um, and I think was that wise but welcome so 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 welcome and thank you for joining me thank you for allowing me into your home and to spend these few moments with you if you haven't found the liturgy this week uh, in the link below you can download it it'll be on our website and it'll also be on our Facebook page last week we uh, explored John chapter 20 and we explored how Jesus reacted upon his disciples uh, uh, fear and their uncertainty and they were defined by what happened around them and then Jesus spoke into that scenario into their emptiness so to speak and gave them his peace this gift of peace and they were redefined not by external uh, events th things that happened around them but they were defined by who God announced them to be and that was a wonderful uh, a moment in time to share with you it was wonderful for me to do the study <clears throat> and as promised this week we will continue in this book uh, we are still in John we're still in John chapter 20 but we are going to move on just a little bit further and just explore one of the characters that we find there now his name is Thomas um, and we know Thomas off by heart we will say oh that's doubting Thomas but looking at all the scriptures we see that Thomas doesn't feature that much we don't get to know him as well as we get to know Peter or Paul we see him on the outskirts and really apart from the lists where the disciples are named we find Thomas only three times the first time we find him is when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and uh, Thomas was the one saying well I'll go with you Jesus I'll I'll come with you even if it means that I'm have to, I have to die with you so that's the first time we meet him now that doesn't sound like doubt to me that sounds like someone who's committed someone who knows that Jesus is the Christ the Messiah the second time we find Thomas is um, in John chapter 14 and in John chapter 14 we find Thomas asking questions but if you read the whole passage you'll see that it's not just Thomas who's asking questions Peter's asking uh, questions Philip is asking a question Judas has a question it's like the whole gang all of the disciples were confused and unsure as to exactly what is Jesus saying what is he trying to teach them or what is he saying about his own future and where he's heading so I don't think that sounds like doubt I think the moment that is uh, worded in, in John uh, 14 where we find Thomas and the other disciples I think that moment is a moment of confusion maybe a moment where they couldn't believe their ears and they had to make sure what is he saying what is he saying to them what is he saying uh, about himself and the third time the final time that we meet Thomas is here in our passage in, in John chapter 20 now here it does sound like Thomas is filled with doubt just to recap Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared to his disciples and at that moment the disciples were together but Thomas wasn't with them and when Jesus had gone again the disciples rushed and made sure they went to Thomas and told him we saw Jesus he rose from the dead and Thomas's reaction was if I don't see him, if I don't see the marks in his hands, if I don't see the marks in his side and am and, and, and able to put my hands on it, I, I can't believe. I can't believe. Now despite this, and despite the household title, um, and I say that a bit tongue-in-cheek, but despite the household title that Thomas carries, there are some valuable insights in his life. And that you and I can, I think, grab onto and hold onto if we discover and just study a bit deeper than just what the, the first layer on this passage suggests. Our encounters with Thomas, if we read all of them, talk about a man 
of sober faith. Someone who questions, someone who asks, what is this about? How does this work? How am I supposed to react upon this? How am I supposed to understand this? He's really someone who questions in an attempt to understand. And I think all of the passages about Thomas suggest that he knows that Jesus is the Messiah. He knows that Jesus is the Christ, the one who came from heaven to open up a whole new world, to share the good news, to bring forgiveness and freedom. And I think that quality of Thomas is valuable. I think it's a good quality to have. And I urge myself and I urge all of us to um, endure to do the same, to be of sober faith. It's so easy to say, oh, we just believe like children when things get tough. It's so easy to shy away from those somewhat tough discussions about faith and religion and our journey with God and our impact in this world. But Thomas wouldn't. Thomas would engage it. Thomas would ask the questions. Thomas would wrestle with the tough stuff in order to understand, in order to get to the point where he would know that Jesus is the Messiah. And this is how it works and this is how it plays out and this is how I understand it. What I also think we find in John chapter 20 is that Thomas is making this announcement. He's saying, I can't believe if I don't see. I think in that statement of doubt, we find also a statement of faith and belief. Now, firstly, I'd like you to remember that doubt is not the opposite of faith. Doubt is also not the same as unbelief or disbelief. And Thomas is not saying Jesus is not the Messiah. He's not saying that God is dead and that there's nothing left to live for and that it's all just a waste of time. He's saying, in this moment, if I can't see the revelation of God, I can't believe. And that's something completely different. I think doubt is best described uh, as the tension between faith and belief. Shortly, belief is that what we can say about God. That's what we hold true. That's what we hold um, as valuable and what we declare to be this is God. It's the revelation of God and that forms our belief. And a friend of mine said that we can engage in, uh, what did he call it, mental gymnastics. We can engage in mental gymnastics for hours without ever sharing a part of ourselves. And that's because we are talking about what we believe and not about our faith. And this bit brings me thirdly to faith. Faith is not what we believe about God. Faith is our response to what we believe about God. Literally, I think it's our response to the revelation of God in our lives. So, doubt is the tension between these two. Doubt is the tension between belief, or that which we know to be revealed from God, the truth, and faith, our response on this belief. I think if we read in Romans chapter 10, we find that brief statement which says, So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes from the word of Christ. Now that, I think, highlights what I'm trying to say. Faith is something that happens when we see God revealed. And perhaps I should say that belief then is our picture of God. It's what we Think about what we see, what we believe about God. And so Romans says this, Faith is the result of, comes by, hearing the revelation of God. And that's the word of Christ. And that's our ultimate revelation of God, is our Bible. And it's true that once we open our Bibles and we read the passages and we find Christ in those passages, our lives respond, faith comes alive in us. And we live by faith. Doubt, as tough as it is, is a healthy thing. It's not unhealthy. It's not something that we should shy away of. It's not something that we should not embrace. 
that doubt that, make, that made Thomas remain true to himself. That made Thomas ask questions as he always does. That made Thomas ask for the revelation of God to inform his faith. And he did so amidst a mountain of conflicting evidence. Now remember who we find here. We find Thomas, the friend and disciple of Jesus Christ. The one, uh, one of twelve, at least twelve, who spent a considerable amount of time with Jesus. Who walked the streets with him, who saw him do miracles, who heard him teach, who sat at his feet, who was present when he fed all those people, when he healed so many. His faith was informed by the revelation of Jesus as the Messiah. And then Holy Week happened. Jesus was arrested and trialed and murdered and he died and he was put in a grave. And understandably, Thomas's whole world comes crumbling around him. The belief that which he knew about God has now been questioned and his faith, his response on that is suddenly uncertain. Suddenly not at the stage or a place where it's happy and easy. It's tough and difficult. And he's not prepared to say because someone else says they saw Jesus or because someone else says they had a revelation from God, I'm going to simply have a faith response. I'm going to believe. I'm going to have this faith life based on hearsay. He's saying, no, no, no. If I, Thomas, cannot be present when God reveals himself, if I cannot have the revelation of Jesus Christ as the risen Lord, then I cannot believe. Then I cannot have the same response as someone else. In my own words, I'd like to think that Thomas is saying, if God doesn't reveal himself as the resurrection, resurrected Lord, then I remain broken, confused and lost. I'm not prepared to simply look at all the evidence, all the conflicting reports, and then say, all right, I'll make my own conclusions. I need the revelation of God. I need to build upon that or I have nothing. The miracle in Thomas's life is that Jesus meets him in the center of his doubt. In this tension, this world of tension that he finds himself in, where he's seeing the conflicting information, where he knows that the Romans also know the body of God, the body of Christ has disappeared. His disciple friends have said they saw Jesus alive. He saw Jesus being dead, being put in the grave. Amongst this mountain of conflicting reports. And in this broken and shaken world where he finds himself in the tension that is doubt, Jesus meets him right there. When Jesus shows up, Jesus simply says, here are my hands. Here is the mark in my side. And all of a sudden, the belief, the revelation of God makes sense again. And that which Thomas knew to be true, which he heard from the mouth of Jesus himself, was whole again. It's like the doubt came full circle. And suddenly, this shaken, upside down, broken, horrible event that was Easter comes to fruition and Jesus is the Messiah. I knew this. I know he is the Messiah. And now he has revealed it to me, to Thomas. That's the miracle. That's the beauty. And that's also true for us. It's in our doubt. It's there where we ask the questions. We, we don't assume that we have all the truths lined up and that everything is certain and structured and ordered. It's in the tension that we find that Jesus meets us right there. Right there. Now like these first disciples, we too could have been huddled behind locked doors. 
We too could have been scared and unsure of what to do. But the revelation of God, Jesus appearing in their midst, sending them out with a message, meant that these 12 disciples, these apostles, there were 11 at that stage, changed the world. They took this good news message and they ran with it. And we think that Thomas ended up in India. We think Thomas took the gospel to the continent of India. And in the church in India, there's a special place for St. Thomas. For he was the one who brought the message to India. If that is true or not, I, I'm not sure I didn't do the research that deeply. But I'd like to believe that all the apostles left a mark. They brought good news somewhere and that changed the lives of people. And it changed our life. You and I who declare Jesus as the risen God, the Messiah, the Lord. We are changed because someone brought the good news. Someone was inspired. Someone reacted on the revelation of God. May we do the same. May God reveal himself in our midst as the resurrected Lord. And may that ignite a spark in our hearts and in our mouths and in our minds so that we can take the good news to there where it is needed. This is how it happens. It doesn't happen when we have it all figured out. It doesn't happen when everything is perfect and aligned and polished. It doesn't always happen when we're together and worshipping in a church, having public services. It happens also there in the stillness of your own heart, of your own living room, where you wrestle with God. And some things about our journey with God is crystal clear and it's simple and it's easy to understand. But some things are hard. And sometimes you and I find ourselves where Thomas found himself in the tension that is doubt. My prayer for us is that God would reveal himself and that his revelation would become our belief and that we as the body of Christ can respond on this in faith. Let me pray with you. Lord Jesus, when Thomas said and declared that he needs to understand, he needs to see, he needs to find you, he needs you to reveal yourself to him, heard him. And so today, this is our prayer. For we too need you to reveal yourself to us here in Aotearoa. We are preparing to go into level three of COVID lockdown. And we need to understand. We want to understand how to be church. How to spread the gospel, the good news in this new world. It's like we're opening in our eyes and the sun is rising and what we see looks so different to what it looked the last time that we saw it. Please help us. Reveal yourself and reveal your church so that we can respond. Grow our belief and grow our faith. Amen. See you next week. Goodbye.